Good morning. That was fantastic. <laughs> it's always nice to start the morning with a little Chopin. So a lot's going on uh, in our world today, particularly here in America. Um, I think we're all sort of waiting for the economy to just get corrected so we can get on with it and sort of go back to, you know, the way things were. Um, most of our time is spent on <clears throat> whether we're in a double dip or a single dip or, or uh, maybe a new dip. But, um, you know, perhaps there's something a little bit more, um, something bigger that's happening that underlies all of everything that we're going through as a country. And one of the things that you know, we think about is, you know, maybe we are as a country actually going through this massive cultural shift. And maybe our beliefs and the way of thinking and how we consume things uh, are changing. And as a matter of fact, we might be in the midst of the greatest cultural shift in our history and we don't really even realize it because maybe our focus is so much on the economy. So let's just take a quick look at some of the things that we've been through as a nation. We spent the last six decades, I think most of you would agree, making products, abundance of products, faster and for a long time cheaper than any other country in the planet. We became the best at every classification. And much of this really had to do with our aspiration in the development of middle class in America in the early days and our aspiration for consuming goods. But what really helped uh, propel this was the fact that you know, after World War II, we were the only act in town because most of the countries that we were competing with were destroyed. So they truly had to buy lots of their goods and services from America in order to survive. And there's been some fantastic times because as we were producing these products, not only were we shipping them around the world, we also became sort of these massive consumers of these products. You know, like anything else, any other success stories, there is always something else going on. And I believe that perhaps we paid a price for all of this success this last 60 years. One of the things that has happened is that our imaginations have been captured by formulas. So this homogenization that sort of went through America and uh, whether it's our food services or automobile or uh, education, everything sort of became this mass oriented. And the problem with that is that formulas can't deal with human emotions. Formulas have no emotions. They have no empathy. So really at some point, you know, we may have just completely lost touch with sort of this human reality and us as a human being. Now during this process, you know, we put a lot of good stuff out there. Lots of good innovation. And some of them are still globally very, very strong and they've changed lives. As an example, we developed spam. This now distributed in 41 countries around the world. It happens to be considered gourmet food in places like Hawaii and Guam. That's a fact. Billions of dollars of this sold. We then discovered that we can can everything, although Napoleon is the one that actually commissioned uh, canning because of the war. You know, America really took the concept and really we just sort of ran with it. So this idea of canning everything because we were so busy, we needed to can the good so we could have it quickly available to us. We then got into powdering everything. So remember those of you in my generation, we came up with Tang, and this stuff actually made it to the moon with the astronauts. Uh, and we also discovered 
you know, uh, dry coffee, okay, powdering coffee. Because again, we were so busy as a society that we really didn't have time for real oranges. We just would be happy having the powder stuff. And this was the ultimate meal. <laughs> we also invented this because we were so busy making stuff and consuming stuff and making money, we didn't have time for a real meal. So, we also did a number on the housing industry. I think we call this today the housing crisis. But maybe we were just making products that people didn't really have a passion for. And it was maybe about commodity. Do you remember, many of you do, we all used to drive one of these things and we were very happy. I had a white one. I grew up in the Midwest. We were very happy. It was a simple vehicle. This is the type of place we shopped in the air conditioning box. I remember going in here with my family. My, my, my dad used to go and have tires put on his car. My mom would go to the third floor and buy laundry and on the way out they would buy a washing machine or something. We don't really shop that way anymore. We like these specialized places that we go shopping. And then this was our ultimate dining experience. Okay, and I think they eventually took the number of burgers they stole off of that because the numbers got too big. And look what's happened to the food industry. You know, we have all kinds of international foods. We even have Asian fusion. I'm still trying to figure out what that is. But our change, our taste has changed. And this was the ultimate experience and places to stay. And if you're doing business in America, this is where you stayed. And we were happy. And we were especially happy when we went to our room in the evening and put a quarter in the bed and it vibrated. And that was like our end of the day spa. And look what's happened to this seg segment today. So we have extended stay, we have luxury, we have the resorts. And our taste have changed. So really what I'm talking about is the fact that mass America, mass culture in America is breaking down. And when mass culture breaks down, it doesn't necessarily dissipate. You know, it breaks down into these niches. And these niches then connect us uh, through our interest. And these niches then develop into you know, what we classify as these uh, subcultures. And these subcultures are global. And when you look at them on a global basis and you put them together, these subcultures are all of a sudden much greater than the American market or the 300 million people that live in this country. So the fact is you're a bunch of niches out there and you probably don't even know it. And so here's a proof. Every one of us is a brand and we're individual and we're sort of getting away from the masses. And a proof of this is you go to eBay or you go into eHarmony and you realize that you, know, you get a photograph here and then you get the little blurb that goes underneath the photograph and uh, it's all about you finding that mate of your life. You know, this is the person you're gonna spend the rest of your life with. You know? And there's a guy in there that looks like he was a, could lose a few pounds and he had his beautiful photographs and he was looking right at the, right at the audience and underneath his, his photo it says, burrito. So here's a guy that was really looking for this burrito eating partner because that was sort of his subculture and that's what he was looking for. So I think if you really want to know how people are branded, you go on eHarmony, you can really see how people actually brand themselves. Hey, I'm a surfer. You know, you eat like a surfer, you dress like a surfer, you act like a surfer, you consume like a surfer. You could be an artist and you eat like an artist, you dress like an artist, well, or a bum. I can't really tell, tell the difference sometimes, but they're both vibey. Okay, so, but they, they consume as an artist. Or you could be a biker. You, know, you walk into the bank, you see one of these guys, and that's his identity, and that is his brand. Or you could be, you know, plain old geek. You know, these guys, you know, these guys are fashionable right now, and they made a lot of money in the 90s. Um, or you could be an environmentalist. You know, this is no longer a tree-hugging situation. You know, you add the environmentalist, and you, you look at this on a global basis, you realize that there are lots of these people when you connect them together into these subcultures. So culture, perhaps, is a new currency. And it's something that we might have avoided in this country. As a matter of fact, you know, we, I think most of the West thought of culture is something you use to make yogurt. 
And I think we're discovering that there's other things we can do with this stuff. And so, as far as we're concerned, it's much greater than demographics. You know, I remember when I was in the business segment, you know, it was all about is it Gen X or is it Gen Y or is it you know, the baby boomer? And truly, I don't think that's the instrument of measure anymore. The instrument of measure is culture. I mean, how do you make the cultural connection? And people's beliefs. And so, this is a fascinating market. You know, you walk into a Trader Joe's, it's not about age. You see 18 year olds and 16 year olds and you see 80 year olds. Maybe they just made the cultural connection. It's not about a specific demographic. And I can give you and share with you lots of these examples. So, is this a brand or is this culture? Lots of my friends drive this vehicle and I will promise you that none of them had owned a Toyota in the past. It's not even that great of a car. My wife drives one of these things, I call it the toaster, it really pisses her off. But, you know. but I think she didn't buy this because of the Toyota, I think she just subscribed to this culture. It's like, hey, I'm doing my part. It's a statement. And wouldn't it be interesting if world's largest auto company, in the place that I grew up in Michigan, General Motors, had connected or made this cultural connection early on, things would have been different for GM. Why is it that Toyota figured it out and GM missed on this? It literally put them out of business. So when I talk about culture as the new currency, I think that's a good example. So, Americans, 4.5% of the population, 25% of the world goods, we get the Olympic medal for consumption. China is right behind us, they will probably surpass us. But we've done a nice job holding the torch here. But why is it that with all of this abundance we've had, you know, our freedom of choice is just necessary, that, you know, we're not feeling it, you know, we're not feeling the love. Uh, and how do you make a connection, you know, to a culture that has, or communities that have, you know, so much abundance of things? I mean, that's maybe one of our, our issues right now that we need to look at. And maybe that doesn't have anything to do with the current economy. So, I read stories about people being depressed and they wake up in the morning and you know, you take an antidepressant and then you go shopping. <laughs> and it's sort of a, in some ways it's become sort of this sort of American habit. And, you know, when our president goes on national TV and says, everybody go out and shop, we need to fix the economy. And there's such huge number of the economy is driven by consumption. I think there's something really sketchy, scary about that. So, in the 70s and 80s, technology sort of made a promise of this leisure time, you know, so we were going to have computers and the sophistication of technology was going to take care of a lot of this stuff so we could just have some free time and lay by the pool. Ended up not happening, you know, so what happened? Uh, the new statistics actually show that we're working as a country an extra 200 hours a year. We even work on our vacations now, I think most of you know that. So what happened? Technology was supposed to help us, actually, and allow us more freedom and more time. I think one of the issues might be the fact that you know, we became this nation of upscaling. So really, if you look around us, and Orange County is perhaps a good example, you know, everybody wanted sort of the bigger house and the bigger car and the bigger this and the bigger that. And so upscaling was something that we deserved. You know, as a country, hey, you know, we're the chosen one and we deserved it. Uh, maybe that's, you know, maybe that was part of the issue. And so really what's happened is, you know, comfort is no longer enough. We need more. We need more to satisfy, satisfy our needs. So therefore it became somewhat of a shopaholic. So, you know, I shop, therefore I am. And what's happened is, you know, we're starting to create these consumption machines, you know, the minute, you know, you have a newborn, you know, it's all, they're getting blasted with this sort of logoing and branding that's going on. And even before teens, you know, you know, we've, in some ways, we've just kind of have this super consumer now that we're training, you know. And it's, 
on the internet, I mean, I've got small kids and, you know, it's on the internet, it's, it's on Facebook or Twitter or what have you. There's a lot going on in terms of sort of branding and, and consumption. And so what happens then is as we grow up, we just basically move into a larger home and, you know, get a bigger garage and just add more stuff. And, you know, in some ways, you know, perhaps what's happened is that some of these objects are, have become more important than you know, our ability to develop relationships. And so when these things start to grow out of our garages, then we, of course, you know, we have this sort of backup plan <laughs> where we go into these storage units and we fill them on. That kind of opens up your garage to put more stuff in. I think Daniel Pink in one of his books talks about this pretty eloquently. So would you rather shop at a supermarket or a farmer's market? Would you rather buy your salad in a plastic bag that's been chemical washed or from a farmer that's grown it organic? The farmer also creates community because there's a social aspect. So it's not just about racing down to the sort of the supermarket to pick up the salad, but there's something else going on. And you know, you would think that this is sort of a California and New York thing, but really it's happening all around the country. In some places it really never went away. And so when we go to Europe and we go to these small villages and you see this going on, you know, I think there's just has really just this fantastic feeling, you know. So why is gardening and growing your own vegetables all of a sudden become so fashionable again? It just it's incredible how many people are now really want to get involved and they want to be a part of growing their food and growing their vegetables, you know. We're doing a project up in Portland, Oregon, and I would say Portland is just definitely the leaders in this. It's just incredible, the interest back to gardening. Because they're beautiful. I mean, these things actually look sexy to me. <laughs> or is this the future? Because we're so busy. People are looking for content in their lives. It's no longer about taking the shopping cart and throwing stuff in it. I think what we purchase and the things that we want to be connected with, we have to have that sort of emotional connection, obviously. So I'm not a demographic, I'm not a number, I'm not a statistic, I'm not a barcode, I'm a human being. We all have a heart. It's working right now, at least for most of us. <laughs> pumping blood through our circulation. We have emotions. Maybe it's not no longer about a marketplace, but it's about the community. And I remember when I was in the surfing industry, you know, I used to have the Wall Street analyst call me and says, well, how big is the surfing market? And you know, my answer to them was, I don't really know. But what I do know that people in South Africa surf and people in New Zealand surf and there's people in Australia that surf and there's people in California that surf and there's people in New Key, England that surf and there's people in Brazil that surf and, and on and on and on and Indonesia that surf and if you add all these people together you have this massive community and that's the community that we're working with. So we're starting to see this shift from being a passive consumer to active participant. And a lot of this obviously through the internet. You know, it's just no longer about selling people stuff. You know, people want to know the ingredients. People want to know what's in it. Remember years ago that Nike got caught making soccer balls in places where they were using underage. You know, it really, really hurt the company. As a matter of fact, they set up an entire division within the organization so that doesn't happen again. So our audience are really watching this and they want to be co-authors and they want to be co-producers and regardless of product, whether you're in the food business or the surfing business or making automobiles and people want to participate. And that's something else that's going on. So we need to have and create this sense of ownership within the community. I just know in my industry there's just no, no longer you can just show up in a community and, and, and plop down a development. And it's past trying to do your CEQA reports and so forth. You have to get the community involved, and regardless of size of the project. So, in some ways, you know, I do think that we're back to the grassroots when it comes to communication. So, as sophisticated as things have gotten, you know, basically, globe, 
the world has become the village as opposed to the village being the village. And really what that means is the local plumber is lousy. Everybody's going to know about it. They're going to know about it. So you can't hide anymore. And really what that's done is made truth fashionable again, and it's no longer a luxury. Because if you're not doing something right, somebody in a basement somewhere around the world can get on their computer and figure it out and nail you for it. And it's very expensive. So in some ways, maybe we're going through this reversal, you know, eats east meets west. You know, I find it fascinating that people in India and other parts of the world have been doing yoga for hundreds of years. And why is it that, you know, yoga now is one of the biggest disciplines going across America, throughout every state. And why is it? You know, maybe what's happening is that we're actually, as a culture, becoming much more of a spiritual society and going away maybe from the consumption society. And perhaps we're going to let the consumption go to the other places of the world, whether it's the Middle East or China or India or Russia. And I think any of you folks that have visited these countries recently, I think you can feel the consumption. So there is a reversal for all. A friend of mine shared something with me recently, the fact that you know, in the 50s we were building our factories and manufacturing, and 60s you know, it was all about becoming the superpower. And then came the 70s, and it was about love. And then came the 80s, and 80s was all, all about greed. Okay, I remember those years. And then became the 90s, and 90s was all about ego. As a matter of fact, what's happened in Wall Street is sort of the, you know, what's, it's a result of what's happened here in the 90s, you know? For some of these folks, it's still about ego. So now, if I was going to punch this to 2010, what would you think is our cause here? What are people thinking? How about this? Okay, and those of you who are not an Al Gore fan, I slid this slide in here for you as well. <laughs> it is about cause, and I think people are, are thinking cause. Um, but I think the most important thing that I like to leave with you with is the fact that culture is not an end game. It is a journey. And nobody says that America has to be the way it is. Maybe this two to three hundred years of culture that we've brewed up here in this country is ready to move on into bigger and better things. Thank you very much. <laughs>